Okay, so uh, why don't we finish up talking about inferior displacements here. <clears throat> Deshali, what do you think of this case? It's a 39-year-old man, uh, underhead ball player with right shoulder pain, worse with uh, overhead motion following trauma during a match a year ago. So you have a frontal radiograph of the right shoulder, and uh, there's a curvilinear increased density along the inferior margin of the glenoid. Um, which is irregular and maybe related to an, an old fracture. Uh, and then we have uh, multiple coronal images, PD fat set and uh, T1 weighted images. Um, so there's an arrow sign. Which, so there's a there's edema along the humeral attachment of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Um, so there's a tear there. And the image below it, so this arrow is pointing to the triceps Long head attachment, the inferior aspect of the glenoid. Um, yeah, the triceps so, attachment is a little bit more, more medial here. Yeah, more proximal. We have a tear of the inferior glenohumeral ligament attaching in the ligament. You've got this bony spur here. So what this is, this is a bony avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, or medial lesion. And here on the sagittal images, we can see the one down the triceps. Uh, it's a lot of atrophy of the teres minor muscle here, and uh, this is the area of the avulsive injury, and this is that little bony prominence that we saw on the coronal images where the bone uh, was displaced. And then here you can see the axillary nerve here, how close it is. That's why John was saying in the old days you didn't want to stick a hot poker down here for inferior displacements because you didn't want to fry the axillary nerve as well as the vessels next to it. And there's the nerve coming across here on the axial images. So this is a uh, bony glenoid avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Okay, so why don't we go on to talk about superior label tears now. <clears throat> and this is an area that continues to undergo a lot of changes in categorization and description. Uh, so superiorly, this is an area where some people talk about the term micro-instability being about 6% of instabilities of the shoulder. <coughs> uh, uh, but we're going to primarily talk about superior labral anterior-posterior tears or slap tears. Uh, this is a terminology that was popularized by a local uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon in the valley that, uh, uh, that Greg Applegate works with, uh, Steve Snyder. Okay, so micro-instability, uh, uh, symptoms are very similar to rotator cuff. It's hard to dif differentiate them clinically. They get uh, slipping and instability when not abductive and externally rotated. They get easy fatigability, periscopular pain, and symptoms of impingement. <clears throat> and these c can be caused by superior label tears or biceps tears, uh, anterior superior label detachments called slack lesions, superior glenoid ligament laxity or tear, middle glenoid ligament uh, detachment, and then uh, partial tears of the rotator cuff. So we'll talk about some of these lesions. Now, <clears throat> I'm talking about just slap tears, uh, superior labral tears. As you all probably know, these there are many different uh, types now that have been described. Uh, my recommendation is not to use the type unless you want to use types 1 through 4, which were the original Snyder descriptions. Uh, these later types have been described by both orthopedic surgeons and a lot of the latest ones by, by uh, radiologists. And I'll go through each of these uh, to describe, to, uh, to show what they look like. But my recommendation is to describe the findings and not to give a type, unless you're working with someone who wants to know the type. <clears throat> So uh, as far as nomenclature, uh, when you're talking about position around the glenoid, there are two major schemes. One is the o'clock scheme, where 3 o'clock is anterior, 9 o'clock is posterior, 12 o'clock is superior, and 6 o'clock is inferior. And then there's just uh, uh, dividing it into six uh, different uh, Areas, there's a superior, anterior, superior, anterior, inferior, inferior, posterior, inferior, posterior, superior. Uh, 
So you can kind of kind of take your, your pick here. I tend to use the one on the left, and I rarely, though occasionally, I use the one on the right. So, uh, Amp John. With you, John. What? Ambos agrees with you. Mm. Okay. Now, as far as uh, slap tears, type 1 slap tear uh, is the degenerative fraying of the superior labrum. So if this is a labrum, anterior is to your right, posterior is to your left, inferior down, superior above. Here's the biceps tendon coming around to attach to the uh, superior tubercle up here. And this would be fraying of the labrum uh, inferior to the biceps attachment without involvement of the biceps. And this all comes from an AJR article from San Diego. Uh, so that would be a type 1 slab. So this is a normal where we have just a little bit of a superior recess which is considered normal. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Dr. Cruz. Great. Welcome. So we're talking about uh, slap tears right now, and we're starting with type 1. So, okay. So this would be normal. What we're seeing here, this is the biceps anchor where the biceps tendon attaches. Here is the superior labrum, and we have a little recess here, and these are variable. And there is some discussion. Most people consider a little recess here to be normal. It certainly is not a treatable pathology, though you don't see them in kids. So other people believe these are, are development from wear and tear, but don't cause symptoms and are, are, are not treatable lesions. And that's important because, as you'll see later, uh, these are occasionally fixed surgically uh, without significant improvement of patient symptoms. The superior triangular labrum is nice and black. Now, often we will see a plane between the superior labrum and the biceps tendon, but not always. Sometimes they're close together here, and sometimes they're actually physically uh, kind of interlocked with one another. Uh, so occasionally, if you tear off the biceps tendon, you'll tear off the labrum as well because they'd be me uh, attached mechanically, but not always. So this, this is within normal limits for a superior labrum. Uh, and here's an abnormal superior labrum. Here we can see the long head of the biceps tendon coming over to the biceps anchor. We can see a plane between the biceps tendon and the uh, superior labrum. Here we can see uh, what looks like a superior recess, but the normal superior recess is a curved structure. It's not straight. There are very few normal straight lines in the body. So if you see a straight line, you've got to be suspicious. Plus you can also see uh, abnormal signal going into the labrum proper. And at surgery, this was a type 1 slap tear, kind of a degenerative tear. Now, a type 2 uh, tear. Welcome, Max. Uh, a type 2 tear. Thank you. We're talking about slap tears. So a tap two, type 2 slap tear is a uh, degenerative type tear of the superior labrum, but it also involves the biceps anchor. And... Uh, this is a much more significant injury than a type 1. Uh, and a type 2 may be a surgical lesion because it may be associated with an unstable biceps anchor, which can produce pain. So here we can see uh, a nice uh, triangular superior labrum, nice curvilinear superior recess, a normal uh, space uh, separation between the biceps tendon and the superior labrum. Well, recess biceps. Uh, now, uh, here we can see there are too many lines here. First, we can see that there's a, a little recess here. Then there's a second line there, and you shouldn't have two lines. So this is a tear going into the superior labrum. We can also see we don't have a nice black structure here. We actually have high signal intensity uh, within the biceps anchor itself. And then if we go to the next cut over, we actually see something that can be very helpful in subtle lesions. We see a fluid collection outside the joint space where one shouldn't exist. Uh, and this is a paralabral cyst, which is fluid extending through the uh, slap tear and collecting external to the joint space. Now, type 2 slap tears have also been uh, uh, divided by Morgan into three types. 
Uh, type 2A is anterior to the biceps anchor, 2B is posterior to the biceps anchor, and type 2C goes back and forth. I strongly recommend you not use these terms in a report. Just describe it. it the only thing here is to let you know to kind of look for it. And qu quite frankly, uh, this is not as popular as it, as it used to be. It's often very difficult to delineate exactly the full extent of the tear on an MR examination. Uh, so uh, I, I generally don't even try to do this. Uh, the vast majority of slap tears that you'll see will be superior tears that will, which will extend anteriorly. So 2A is going to be by far the most common. But uh, we'll also occasionally see it extending back into the posterior labrum and not into the anterior labrum. And commonly, it'll go both directions. But I, I describe those, but I don't talk about A, B, or C. Uh, now, kind of associated with this, uh, and here where you can kind of see arthroscopically, this would be an A, anterior uh, superior tear, B, posterior superior tear, and then here's one that goes all the way back and forth. Okay, and here we can posteriorly, we can see a, this is a mar marked irregular, there's fluid going into the, to the labrum. It's not nice and smooth like we saw before for normal, that's a slap tear. Here we can see going further, we've got fluid extending through the tear. Uh, uh, underneath the long head of the biceps tendon. And then here we can actually see going, and it's, now it's involving part of the biceps anchor, and it's extending anteriorly. And we can see the biceps is, is uh, almost completely torn here with just a little bit of superior fibers. So that would be type 2. Now, uh, kind of associated with this is what's called a peelback mechanism, uh, which is thought to produce the type 2 C tears, and overhead throwing athletes. And that is uh, in the kind of normal abducted position, the biceps tendon comes straight off the, the superior part of the glenoid here. But when you get back in the cock position throwing, you actually twist the biceps, you pull it more posteriorly, and it has a tendency to start ripping anteriorly and then pull back uh, in what's called the peel back mechanism, where you tear off the biceps anchor, starting from the front and then extending posteriorly. And that can cause a lot of symptoms uh, when, you, when you do that. And that would be that would occur in the cocking phase uh, uh, where you have a lot of forces on the biceps. And just when you start to go forward again, you fire the biceps and it produces a lot of strain on the biceps anchor attachment up here. So that's the, the so-called peelback mechanism. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dan, what do you think of this case? All right, we have a chrono and it <clears throat> looks like an axial uh, PD fat set with uh, uh, an artogram of the shoulder. Um, the chrono image looks like a superior labrum. Um, there is a big signal, uh, so it like looks like a slap tear. I'm not sure how much, I mean, I'm, it's just like a superior labral tear. I don't know how much it goes to extent. A parallel cyst. And also on the axial view, looks like this also extends anterior and posterior with another posterior parallel cyst or or contrast. Ex right. uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Sure. So we've got a uh, forty-nine-year-old female with. Uh, shoulder pain. Looks like we've got a T2 and a PDFS femoral image. Um, yeah, so we've got a superior labral tear, a slap tear um, up there. Yep, uh, irregularity. Um, main lines. Now the question is if this is going to involve the uh, biceps anchor, um, which. Okay. Yeah, can... So, so this is the superior labrum. Mm -hmm. It's torn and inferiorly displaced. This is the long head of the biceps. So it does. Yep. And so the bice, long head of the biceps is completely torn as well, but but not retracted at this point. In fact, sure. what we can see here uh, is that there's, there's a big tear, uh, uh, a high-grade partial tear. And that other image was right in here where we can see it torn, but there are a few fibers still remaining to, to keep it from being uh, retracted. And this would be a type 2 slap tear with involvement of the biceps. Okay. Uh, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? So we have a T2. Uh, <clears throat> T2 axial of the uh, shoulder. And uh, 
or <clears throat> so uh, the you can see, clearly see on the uh, uh, anterior uh, the anterior uh, superior portion of the uh, labrum that we have a uh, a, uh, a high intensity uh, uh, basically signal uh, coursing through it with a paralabral cyst. Uh, so this is consistent with a, uh, a slap tear, uh, and then uh, this uh, T2 uh, uh, sagittal image, uh, we can see that the uh, paralabral cyst uh, actually extends anteriorly, and it's, uh, it's inferior to the uh, corner uh, process, and uh, so it actually extends and, into the subscapularis extension of the joint space. Right. Yes, and here we can see it over here. Uh, same patient. Uh, it looks like yeah. uh, this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this looks like a T2 uh, coronal image, and uh, we have the uh, arrow designated as uh, pointing to this uh, uh, again a paralabral cyst, which is extending uh, posteriorly and all the way along the uh, yeah. uh, just underneath the uh, uh, supraspinatus. Tendon. Okay, good. Uh, uh, let's see, Max. What do you think of this? Uh, I won't be able to take cases. I'm, I'm uh, making my eyes on the road, but I'm listening to you guys. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So you have coronal PD fat sided images of the shoulder. Um, and the. This looks like it's a little more posterior um, in terms of the joint space. So. Uh, I don't see discrete low signal intensity within the expected location of the labrum, but there's... What we're seeing here, this is an arthrogram study. This is a T1 fat set and this is a PD fat set. Okay. So on the T1 image, there's like intermediate signal intensity where on the PD fat set we see high signal intensity. So there's not contrast there, but it's fluid from the joint space that's separate from the um, contrast in the joint space. Um, so presumably a paralabral cyst, which doesn't communicate, or it's non-communicating with the joint space because of the arthrogram. Um, so there's a superior labral tear. There's the superior labral. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this was a tear of the superior labrum here, and uh, and this was a paralabral cyst associated. With so sometimes seeing the paralabral cyst uh, leads you back to where the, where the tear is, and sometimes these cysts are much easier to detect than the actual tear itself. So you obviously have to look at the, the labrum, uh, but uh, use these paralabral cysts as good markers for where your eyes should go. Yeah. We have a chrono and sagittal, um, looks like another pd fat set uh, arthrogram of the shoulder. Uh, the image on the left, it looks like there is high signal in the superior labrum, which goes to the anchor, um, or somewhat part of the anchor. anchor. And the uh, image on the right uh, looks like there is also signal posteriorly, and also there is a hemorrhoid head, um, kind of like, I'm not sure, that little traction change. Yeah, so again, I guess I'm, this, this is another labral tear. Um, and uh, again, we have another sagittal and chrono image. Um, this patient looks as, as still young because uh, I'm, I'm not sure. And there is a little tiny paralabral cyst in the superior. So, okay, so that's 92607. Okay. And the, when, how far was it ago? I'm sorry. It was nine, the other one was 9.26.07. Okay, so almost like a year so, later. Uh, again, we have a chrono and axial PD fat set arthrogram of the shoulder. Uh, on this image, it looks like the superior labrum has this kind of heterogeneous signal, but I'm not sure if it's been fixed or... Uh, but I don't see it. Yeah, it's a little um, suture anchor. Um, looks like they fixed it. So this is what we started with. Right. Okay, now they put in suture, suture anchor. anchor. And now we we're not seeing so they shaved it off a little bit, I guess. And we don't see that fluid going deep to the Right. Anymore. So it's been fixed. And 
to suit your anchor, anchor sorry. Uh, 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 and then, then there was a slab too, and I wouldn't slab repair. So this is what a repair looks like after you uh, uh, do it. And the patient was doing well. So the same principle applies to the meniscal repair post post op with orthogram to this slab tears. I mean, or like any labral tears. In terms of like, uh, it has to enhance the contrast goes through to call the re, re tear for the patients who are like post operative. The uh, but yeah, post operative, you you shouldn't see uh, yeah you uh, the paralabral cyst should go away. And you actually shouldn't see any clefts, full clefts in the in the labrum. Okay. okay. So, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Okay. Well, we've got a couple of uh, coronal CT images, and it looks like we've uh, injected some intraarticular contrast uh, into this patient. Um, and um, okay, so it looks like we're seeing. Uh, Contrast sort of setting into where we'd expect the CT of the labrum to be and kind of even outlining it so, rather nicely. Um, so this would be, of course, concerning for a slap tear. And yeah, they're kind of posteriorly on the image. We see this uh, kind of uh, line itself is vertical. Um, yep. So that's a contrast dissecting into the um, labrum. So we've got a slap tear and uh, involvement of the biceps labral anchor as well. So you can see it with with CT, but but I think CT is, is is a lot more difficult, and there's a lot of degenerative pathology that's a lot harder to see with CT. And obviously, if it's something that doesn't communicate with the joint space, uh, you don't have the contrast with CT like you do with MR, and you also can't evaluate acute bone injuries, which I think are often important because uh, if you have acute bone injuries then that may often be the cause of the symptoms and not necessarily the labral pathology you're seeing. So in that setting, you might want to have the, let the bone injury heal first before assessing the patients and deciding on surgery. Okay, and then if we go to type 3 slap tears, type 3 is a bucket handle tear of the superior labrum without involvement of the biceps, uh, with it, which is unstable. And uh, here's an example of a bucket handle tear. We can see a complete tear through the base of the superior labrum. The anchor is intact, and this is just a, an unstable bucket handle tear of the superior labrum. Uh, here's a, another example where we can see fluid going in here and some uh, instability. The long head of the biceps tendon is intact, and this is the superior labral fragment, which is detached from its uh, superior attachment. And these can often, these typically go anteriorly. They can also go posteriorly as well, but, but this one extends anteriorly to involve the anterior superior labrum in a configuration that's, that's very different from the configuration that we see in a sublabel foramen. Uh, this is too irregular and too separated. And then farther down, we can see that the tear doesn't stay at the base of the labrum, but extends actually into the anterior labrum. And that's abnormal. And this is a, a tear. If we go one cut further, the more inferior anterior labrum is, is normal. So this is a slap tear extending anteriorly, uh, but superiorly it's really a bucket handle fragment, and so this would be a type 3 slap tear, which is extending anteriorly. And then there's a type 4, and this is really the most significant of the, of the uh, original types of uh, tears, and this is a type 3, where you have a longitudinal extension of the tear into the biceps tendon, and these tend to be the ones that are most symptomatic. And these are typically, that there's been a lot of controversy as to, in terms of treatment of slap tears. Slap uh, surgery was very popular uh, 7 to 10 years ago when a lot of this first came out. And then what happened, a lot of people then started saying that a lot of these shoulders were over-constrained and that actually let, you know, the surgery led to more symptoms than the patients had before they had surgery. So now, generally, most slap tears are not operated on. But a type 4 may be best treated surgically uh, because of the pain associated with the longitudinal tears into the biceps tendon. So... Uh, Let's see, uh, uh, Me. Jeff, Jeff, yeah. What? Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Johan, what do you think? Well, uh, not uh, not everybody um, 
can be repaired when it comes to these slap tears. So it, sometimes you have to excise um, the bucket handle portion and just remove it. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it these, uh, unless they're really um, uh, athletes that throw them a lot, um, uh, these occur a lot in, in, in older folks, like uh, over the age of 40 and so on. And um, so you, you just treat those like a bucket handle tear of the uh, knee in, in many cases where you, uh, in terms of the meniscus, you, you excise it uh, because you, you're not repairable. Uh, the tissue just isn't there to, to repair. Now in athletes, if the tissue is good, uh, you may uh, use some anchors and repair. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jeff. Yeah, so we have a uh, <coughs> coronal uh, PD fat set, looks like a arthrogram uh, injection. And uh, so looking at the uh, superior labrum, uh, I can see that the uh, there is actually uh, some regular signal, actually the, there's some irregularity of the superior labrum. Uh, and it looks like uh, that it is, this irregular the signal actually goes into the labrum itself. So there is definitely a slap tear. Um, and so that was 222.05 and we have 5608, another uh, similar sequence uh, demonstrating. And it looks like on this study that the amount of fluid uh, actually is increased. Uh, there's more fluid uh, going into the uh, superior labrum. Now, uh, I would say that the uh, it's a fragment. I'd say we have a fragment there of the superior labrum. So I think this is a type three, a bucket handle tear. So it's a bucket handle tear of the superior labrum, and you see this yeah. longitudinal tear going into the bicep. Okay, so that would be an extension into the biceps tendon, which would be consistent with a type 4 then. So this would be a type 4. And the patient was more symptomatic at, at, uh, later than they were before. They actually became relatively asymptomatic in between the two, even though there was a superior labral tear here. Uh, but uh, that, then the patient came back with more symptoms uh, where it's now a type 4. And then here just uh, uh, sagittal images, we can see more signal going into the uh, biceps tendon there. This is a type 4 slap. Okay, uh, Tashali. So you have coronal anterior uh, T1 and T2 images of the shoulder. And so this arrow is pointing to this uh, intermediate on T1 and low T2 signal intensity structure, uh, which is Probably the long head biceps tendon, right. um, but I'm not sure just on these. Yeah, so, okay. so what we found here on this one cut, we can see a lot of abnormal signal intensity in the biceps tendon. It's not completely torn, it's intact. Uh, but what this was, this is a type of type 4 slap. It didn't have the discrete tear we saw in the last one. This was just severe degenerative disease, but it was kind of like a crab meat appearance at the time of surgery. And we can see that as all this diffuse increased signal intensity, which we typically call tendinosis within the biceps tendon. Uh, but whenever you, it was felt in this patient that a lot of his symptoms were due to whenever he would do anything that would put tension on the biceps tendon, it would hurt because the fibers were probably abnormal. They stretched and that they irritated the nerve fibers within the tendon when that happened. So this was thought to be considered a degenerative type four slap tear. And the superior labrum was very degenerated as well. All right, we have a it looks like a coronal axial T1. Um, what are the images of the shoulder? Again, we see um, abnormal signal on the left image of the superior labrum, and um, I don't really see the biceps tendon either. This is just uh, there. It's kind of like, you know, intermediate signal. And then I guess is either missing or it's actually is like severe degenerative uh, tendinosis. There. It's there, but it's like, you know, so it's a like slap four. Oh, okay. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? 
Sure. So we've got, so I guess, a coronal PDFS image of this patient, and we see a lot of uh, little kind of triangular area of uh, signal into the uh, superior labrum, and we see a lot of signal abnormality adjacent. Yeah, kind of that stuff. Um, so, okay, yeah. Okay, this is the next cut anteriorly. Okay, so we've stepped what, what anteriorly. And we see sort of this um, curve of, yeah, you know, where the circle is this kind of uh, curvilinear area of um, fluid uh, into that. Uh, and you can see this patient right. is in internal rotation here. Here's the intertuberous groove with the biceps anchor in it here. And then the mm -hmm. next cut is over here. This is a sagittal image. I'm sorry. This is a sagittal T2 weighted image. And this is the biceps tendon here. Okay. So it seems to be involved with our labral tear. So, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So this will put yeah, type 4 again. Mm -hmm. So this is another type 4. Again, with thickening and a lot of increased signal intensity and internal tearing involving the, the biceps tendon as well. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this? Jeff, yeah. Uh, so we have a T1 uh, uh, coronal image, and uh, we see regular uh, signal intensity within the superior labrum, uh, and it looks like it's uh, trying to see if we can determine the superior uh, the biceps uh, anchor, uh, but uh, definitely we have uh, There's the anchor right a there. flap tear, and then it looks like there is some fragment. It looks like it is fragmented. And this is what displaced inferiorly. Okay, here's a T2 weighted okay. image at that look. T2 weighted image. So uh, on the T2, I mean, this, that, uh, the signal intensity is definitely uh, uh, increased in this region here, and I think it's consistent uh, and with a, uh, a bucket handle type tear uh, well, and this, this signal going into the biceps anchor right. as well. Yeah. So it's consistent with it. Um, um, this is the stir. Interlibral ex extension of the slap into the biceps tendon would it be a type 4 slap lesion. So it's really an interstitial or intersubstance tear, uh, which start starting at the biceps anchor and then extending distally along the biceps tendon. This is a low field scanner, and we can see very abnormal biceps here on the sagittal images. Uh, and this was a type 4 slap tear as well. Um. I just had a hard time looking on the sagittal, I'm sorry, on the coronal images at the superior labrum. Like on T1, it should be jet black and it's intermediate there. Yeah. So we just assume that it's torn yeah, well, or versus degenerated. Well, when you have increased signal, it should be black. And if it's not black, then it's torn. Okay. And then for, for the type 4, do you distinguish between whether it's degenerative or it's something that would actually go in and fix or do they have to? This is the kind of thing where you have to do a tenodesis. Uh, they generally have to determine that at surgery. Uh, uh, what we can differentiate is if when you have f actual fluid collection within it dissecting along it, you can you can state that in the report, uh, or it, or it's often just diffuse degenerative disease, which is tendinosis. Again, I don't use a type. I don't see a type four slap tear in my reports. I, I would talk about a superior labral tear and uh, either interstitial tearing or, or a uh, severe tendinosis involving the, the biceps anchor and, and the anterarticular portion of the biceps tendon. If the bicep is completely torn and, dis, and, 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 uh, uh, and retracted distally, one is they tend not to have a lot of pain. And number ten, two, if that happens acutely, that's pretty well known clinically because you then have balling up of the biceps muscle in the arm, and that's that's. But uh, so so most of the ones we're concerned about for symptoms have to do with interstitial uh, tears or partial tears of the anchor of the biceps and severe tendinosis within the intraarticular portion of the biceps. And uh, if you see that in the setting of a of a tear of the superior labrum then you're talking about a type 4 slap. But again, I don't use the term type 4 slap in my reports anymore. John, you have a comment? Uh, uh, no. The main thing about type 4s um, uh, and, and that, that uh, uh, enter the biceps, 
uh, you, you, what, if it's a third of, um, uh, of the biceps, uh, you usually will excise it. Uh, if it's larger than a third, uh, I'm sorry, if it's less than a third, you may be able to repair it. If it's more than a third, you excise it and tenodice it. Now, when it comes to what you're looking at here, I don't have enough information to be able to say much about what, what's going on here. Uh, it, it looks to me like there's uh, a bone there um, uh, uh, involving the, the labrum. But uh, uh, you, you say that this is uh, a labral tear. Yeah, I, I think, John, uh, what at surgery, this was a tear of the superior labrum here, this signal. This was an interstitial tear in the biceps tendon. Oh, okay. I, I got it. Uh, yeah, I will. Fluid in that biceps tendon tear. I, what's the age of this patient? Uh, not young. The, 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 okay. I, I, would, I would, I think, so let's say that uh, it was a 65-year-old female. I, I would um, excise uh, it and tenodize the tendon uh, to the biceptal groove. Okay. Of course, uh, these just don't last. Yep, good. Okay, the next type of slap is a type 5 slap tear. Uh, and it's this what this often involves the but the biceps anchor and it extends into the anterior labrum so this is a superior labral tear extending into the anterior labrum and probably because this is a much bigger tear tends to be around longer it often involves the the base of the the biceps as well so uh so who did the last one oh give me a turn. So I have coronal and axial um, PD fat saturated images in a patient who's had an arthrogram. And uh, the anterior labrum is uh, torn and displaced proximally, and there's uh, intraarticular contrast going um, past that into the tear, into the subscapularis uh, fossa. And uh, in the coronal image, there's uh, irregularity of the superior labrum. So it's going from superiorly to anteriorly. With a little bit of involvement of the biceps anchor as well. Okay. So this is a classic type 5 slide which in this case is displaced. Okay. And, uh, here we can see another uh, superior labral tear extending anteriorly. See it there, sending down here anteriorly and down through here. In this case, this patient also had a little bit of a posterior labral t injury as well. And we can see a hill sacs impaction fracture here. So this patient uh, obviously had instability uh, with uh, tears of the superior and anterior labrum, and maybe a little bit of the posterior superior labrum as well. Okay, now a type 6 slap tear is an unstable tear of the biceps anchor and a very irregular tear. And so... There are a lot of people, a lot of shoulder surgeons, which do not like to really differentiate this from the other ones that we've already seen. So this gets uh, a little bit more controversial in, in, this, in this area. And here we can see a, a tear of the superior labrum, and you can see it's extending into the, to the anchor of the biceps with a near full thickness tear of the, of the anchor of the biceps. And this was uh, typed as a type 6 slap tear uh, at surgery. And so I'll go through these, but when we get into these later types, you can see that there's a lot of overlap, and uh, it's not clear that it has a significant impact, I think, on treatment. Here's another a type 7 slap tear. It's a slap tear, but with a longitudinal tear going into the middle glenohumeral ligament. These aren't very common, but here we can see a tear of the, uh, uh, the labrum here, and if you go down below, uh, it's actually, this is the middle glenohumeral ligament, this is the labrum, and you can see a tear extending into the middle glenohumeral ligament here. There's a superior labral uh, tear, more of a degenerative type tear. If we follow it down here, we can see this is the area where the middle glenohumeral ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament, anterior labrum come together that we talked about before. And if you look here where the middle glenohumeral ligament should be, 
If we go farther down, we can see that there's a lot of disrupted tissue uh, in that particular area. Down, down, down further, we can see the anterior labrum at this level looks like it's pretty normal, but the middle glenohumeral ligament is torn and through here. And this was another type 7 slap tear. Type 8 slap tear is a type 2 slap tear, superiorly here involving the biceps anchor, but this one extends posteriorly, as we can see here. So here we can see a superior labral tear uh, up here. Uh, and then if we follow it, uh, we can see it coming back here. And follow it further, we can see the involvement of the posterior labrum with this particular tear following all the way down here. And these are the common, these tears are that we commonly see in weightlifters. Not that this was a weightlifter, uh, but these slap tears going to the posterior labrum are common, uh, and we've already talked about it. You can, you can, you tend not with people, who, young people who have posterior dislocations or seizure patients, they tend to have straight posterior labral tears not involving the superior labrum. But if you have more of a chronic recurrent injury pattern, like in long-term weightlifters, you can also get the, the uh, type 8 slap tear. And here we can see the posterior component of this posterior labral tear back here. And the patient, if you followed it up, it also went up to the superior labrum. Uh, and then you can get all kinds of overlap between these different ones. And I don't want to go into this, just a, a lot of injury here. And uh, 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 there would be a, a type 6 type pattern. And then if we look closely, we can also see that a, there's a type 8 along with it. So with these more complex injuries, and then, and then you can just get circumferential tears that we'll talk about here as well. So as you get into these higher numbers, I think the, the uh, whole scheme of grading it becomes less valuable. Uh, as things get just more complicated. Okay, a type 9 slap tear uh, was actually described by an orthopedic surgeon in Santa Barbara, California, uh, Rick Ryu. And here it's a, almost a circumferential tear with just a little bit of sparing of the inferior uh, labrum. And here we can see, in this case, anterior posterior tears and even extending down to a lot of the inferior labrum as well. A little paralabral cyst. And then there's a type 10 slap tear, uh, which was described by, uh, by Javier Beltran in New York, who's now in Washington, D.C. It's a superior labral tear. It really uh, often involves the, the base of the of the biceps anchor, but this extends into the superior glenohumeral ligament. Yeah, so, uh, and, and this gets more complex. We don't, but the, this would be a type 10, here would be a su superior labral tear, and uh, if we followed it, it, it also went over to the base of the, uh, the superior uh, glenohumeral ligament. and the type 3 that goes into the interval, which could also be considered a type 10 slap tear if it goes to involve the base of the uh, superglenohumeral ligament. Again, I uh, don't recommend being a splitter in this area, and here we can see a paralabral cyst associated with this, and then a tear at the base of the superglenohumeral ligament where it takes off the anterior superior labrum. Okay, uh, let me see. Yeah. 55 year old female with pain. Patient has osteolysis in the left femoral head, uh, needing to use a walker. Uh, we have a chrono, looks like a PD fat sat image with arthrogram. Um, we have, I guess, deformity of the kind of medial femoral, uh, femoral head from, I guess, post-surgical or that defect there. Oh, is it, uh, had osteolysis, I'm not sure about that. Oh, so it looks like a, I'm not sure it's like a Milwaukee shoulder, um, just a lot of like, you know, deformity of the uh, humeral head. And what happened is, what would you say if the humeral head were down here and you had a disc 
Oh, it would be like a superior hill sag, but this is an inferior hill sag. Okay. So this is um, so superior this superior superior dislocation. So if you go back to the history, uh, the patient uh, had a walker, it was a left femoral hit, started using the walker and started Oh, I'm sorry, I was, I was in the femoral head. I, was the, I misread it to femoral head. <laughs> sorry. The, the patient had a, yeah, the patient had a, a osteolysis of the femoral head, yeah. okay. so they couldn't walk anymore. So they had to start using a walker, and then they, and they put the pressure on the on the humerus, and then they got a superior dislocation of the humeral head. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, and that's what we're seeing here. And then with uh, disruption of all the a lot of the superior ligaments in this particular case. This is from Brazil. Okay. And then finally, we can get to multidirectional instability. And there's a recent paper in skeletal radiology just this month, actually, uh, trying to look at MR findings that correlate best with multidirectional instability. And uh, they looked at, uh, with, with you put contrast in, they looked at how much pooling occurred anteriorly and posteriorly on the axial images. Uh, and they found that that actually did not correlate with multidirectional instability. A little bit surprisingly. So what they found is that the best correlate was on an MR arthrogram if you measure the distance from the inferior tip of the inferior labrum down to the uh, lowest point in the inferior uh, capsule of uh, this dis distance EF and uh, that uh, if that's greater than 17 millimeters then there's a very high statistical correlation with that, those patients uh, having multidirectional instability. So that's probably the best measurement we have right now of MR correlate with uh, multidirectional instability. Yes. Does that mean that you talk about non-surgical patients? Yeah. Most multidirectional instability are, are not treated by surgery. There are some surgeries where they did capsular tightening in the past. Uh, and there are a number of different ways to do it. You can placate the capsule. You could go in and heat treat the capsule, which ended up damaging the capsule and leading to worse problems later. But initially it was later. But uh, uh, John, uh, what do you think about treatment for multidirectional instability? Um, I frankly have never uh, um, repaired it, but uh, uh, Campbell's suggest uh, capsular shifting in the direction that's necessary. Uh, and, and, and like you said, tuck, uh, I think it's said tuck, but it's pinch and tuck. Uh, so it's kind of a, uh, another word for it is imbrication. Uh, yeah. where, where you tighten the capsule uh, by overlapping it uh, one, one part over the other and then suturing it together. Um, it's, it's, it's a doable. Uh, what the results are, I'm, I'm really not that, I'm not that sure. Although Campbell says if you use a, if if you do the proper procedure, you you should get decent results. Yeah, I I don't think it's done very often, but it's not that common either. Yeah, and uh, the, now the multidirectional instability needs to be differentiated from people who are voluntary subluxers. Uh, volume. Yeah, that, that's uh, pretty easy to do um, um, because you know they all you do is ask them to, to dislocate and they'll do it for you uh, and if they can do that uh, forget the surgery uh, never ever operate on those as I mentioned before right. so but uh, multidirectional that the condition um, um, is uh, real I, I, I don't I'm not going to say it's not real, uh, but uh, and, and you do have people that have very uh, loose capsules uh, that, that I call loosers, and um, uh, sometimes if uh, there's some kind of desperation, I suppose you might want to do surgery. Like I said, I've never done one, and I have seen them. Okay. Um, I mean, what you do is you refer, you refer them to somebody that does nothing but shoulders or what it like Snyder and he'd probably punt and give it to somebody in New York or something I don't know <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Okay. Here's another patient who has shoulder pain, and we can see some abnormal and anterior and posterior labral abnormalities here. If we go to the uh, more inferiorly after injection, we can see tears of the anterior and posterior labrum, and we can see actually the fluid collecting in the labral tears on the oblique sagittal image. And this was someone uh, who also had multidirectional instability, uh, but most people who have this condition don't have labral tears like we're seeing here. But when you see uh, uh, kind of circumferential or both anterior and posterior labral tears, uh, that's something to consider. Yes, John. Uh, that, that, that last one that was more more like a, a torn labrum, um, not really. A, uh, well, I guess you, you could say it's a multidirectional. Uh, this one, uh, the, I don't know how old this patient is, but this one you could probably uh, put some sutures in, in the labrum and uh, do a bank card procedure type of repair. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Uh, sure, so we've got, it uh, looks like a PD perhaps that image of this 51-year-old uh, who fell um, on the abducted shoulder. Um, so we're seeing a, uh, some signal abnormality of the humeral head there, suggesting that there was some acute uh, injury and also some probably tearing and tendinosis of uh, subscap. But uh, onto the labrum, um, posteriorly we're not seeing much of the labor from there anymore, um, and it looks like there's signal abnormality anteriorly as well. Yeah, capsular tear there, okay. It's a next cut down, and then here. So you can yeah. see that there's really an avulsion of the posterior glenohumeral ligament uh, from the humerus here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm done. Um, th th this uh, uh, is off the humerus, isn't it? Yeah, this is off the humerus. This was a posterior dislocation. Yeah. Um, I don't put it here. Fifty-one. If he's an athletic person, you you, you may want to repair it. Um, yeah. But not really. I'd wait uh, to see what happens. See? It's amazing how, how nature is kind to older people in some ways. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe we're smart enough to just stop using it when it hurts. Well, everybody over the age of 40 has a, a fraying of their rotator cuffs. Yeah. Uh, and then also their labrum. Yeah. And then other cause of this patient had a very severely unstable shoulder. Uh, but you can see that there's a marked longstanding degenerative disease and deformity of the, of the bones, loss of the articular cartilage, and uh, multiple rotator cuff tears. Uh, yes. What? Which one? The next case over. This one? Yeah. Oh, well, this is just, uh, oh. Was it like neuropathic or they had chronic instability from prior dislocations or I don't know. But it could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, total joint replacement. Right. The, this was... Well, obviously, this is a very long-standing degenerative disease, and it's probably post-traumatic. And, and and if not that, uh, either a hanging shoulder or fusion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Why don't we go ahead and stop here? We don't have much more to go on the uh, on the instability, but there are a few complications that I think we we should spend a little time with uh, uh, tomorrow. Okay. Any questions? Yes. This new research that it shows the rear labral capsule distance that's supposed to be 17 millimeter. Um, sometimes you see an arthrogram is not distended. Sometimes you see like a lot of contrast injection. What was the number that they used in terms of like standardized like you know volume for the shoulder injections? Uh, I think they're using CCs, but but that varies a lot because different people have different uh, shoulders. You just need the if, if you get reasonable distension, I think that's all you really need. Okay. Right?